So, hi everyone. Uh, for those of you I don't know, um, I'm an associate professor. I hail from the material science and chemical engineering department, um, but also a core faculty member here in IACS. Uh, I run uh, the Engineered Microstructures and Radiation Effects Lab, and I guess I'm a little bit unique to IACS in that I do a combination of both simulations, computation theory, and experiments. And in fact, the reason why I was late walking in the room was because we're running some experiments at Brookhaven Lab right now that uh, we're not going so well. And um, that's the difference with computation and experiment, right? You could just change your code in one case. And here I'm getting a bunch of frantic calls about what do we do with this material that was lost in the TEM. So, um, so with that said, uh, what I'm going to talk about today, um, my group overall does materials for extreme environments. That, that's in a nutshell what we do. And one of the most exciting extreme environments is that of a fusion energy reactor. So it's a lot of discussion now about fusion energy, and I'll talk a bit, a bit about that in a moment. But what we really do here is we want to combine modeling to design materials that can withstand these extremely harsh environments that materials inside a fusion reactor see as they look at this plasma. Um, so the people that really did this work, a number of students, so Nick Olenek uh, does all the experiments, Sean Moscarenas does all the simulations on this. Um, some of you might know him um, because he does come around IECS a bit. Uh, Cormac Colleen and uh, Streit Cunningham. Streit was one of my prior PhD students who's now at uh, UC Santa Barbara. They work together on some of the mic uh, microscopy work. And then uh, David Sprouse, who's a staff scientist in my group, which uh, he does leads a lot of the synchrotron work that we do at Brookhaven. Um, and then we do collaborate quite a bit with Oak Ridge on this and uh, want to thank the Department of Energy for their support on this work. There we go, got to click the mouse. Um, so we heard a talk this morning, really nice one about um, solar cells. And when you look at energy, how we're going to get away from um, fossil fuels, we need, we need this balanced portfolio. And one of the things that solar cells and wind is not, it's not what you consider a base load energy source. Sun's gonna shine, sun's gonna go down. So you need to be able to store that energy. That's one option. Another option is putting something on the grid that does not produce carbon, does not lead to additional global warming. And one of the, I guess I would call it the holy grail to do this would be fusion energy. Pretty much instead of having a, a, a solar cell that takes the light that comes from the sun, takes the energy that comes from the sun and converts that into electric energy, we actually just create the sun here on earth. That's what fusion is. So how do you do that? Sun's very hot, right? Hundreds of millions of degrees. So the way that it's, there's two different concepts. And the one that I'm going to talk about is magnetically confined fusion. So what you see here is this is a very large press, pressure vessel. This is called a tokamak. And you could see this inner region here. This is where your plasma lives. So anything, any material that sees this plasma, what are they going to see? They're going to see extreme irradiation conditions and what we call a hard hard neutron energy spectrum or very high energy neutrons. And these are the neutrons that we want to capture to heat the surrounding structure in the coolant that then we can use to spin a turbine and there's your power. Um, the other thing is very high heat fluxes. Let me give you a feel for these numbers. Re-entry vehicles coming in from space. They see pretty much this and there's a material that's designed to just ablate away and it's gone and you have to rebuild that whole material. Well, we want this thing to run not for seconds, not for minutes, not for days, for years. So how do we do this with materials? And so we need something high temperature. That's obvious. So tungsten is one of the primary materials that's going to look right at this plasma. Problem with tungsten is it recrystallizes, which means it undergoes a transition in its structure that leads to a shape change. And if you look at different grades of tungsten, here's a recrystallization process. So these are very small grains, you can't see them. And then in like wood in your deck or something, you see something like this, you see these elongated grains. This is after these grains, you essentially have a recrystallization process and large grains form. Sounds like that's not a problem, right? Well, this is what it does to it. Cracks it completely. And when you look at pulsed heating, which is what you're gonna see here, the whole surface starts to just crack and break away. So clearly this isn't gonna work. 
So how do we want to go about this, Mike? We want to say, well, let's make those grains really small. And this is kind of counterintuitive to basic thermodynamics. You're adding a lot of interfacial energy. This is a 50 nanometer length scale. You heard about quantum dots that are tens of nanometers. These grains are 50, you know, 10 to 50 nanometers. You heat them up a little bit and look, this is now a micron scale bar, not stable. But what we could do is we can go into our kitchen of elements and we can go into the spice rack and we can pull out a few elements that we can add to this material that will offset the energetic penalty of all these interfaces. Interfaces are like surfaces. They all have an energy associated with them that makes the material thermodynamically unstable. So if you do that, you can actually stabilize your nice fine grain structure. Here's before and after. And if you don't have any of your ingredients, you could see this distribution shift to large grain sizes. Problem is, this is below the recrystallization point for tungsten, 1100 C. That sounds high. For tungsten, that's not even 50% its melting point. So we got to do better. And this was what we postulated. We said, well, titanium here can be used to stabilize this type of microstructure. And we want to leverage models to design these materials and then employ both you know, more traditional processes and then advanced additive manufacturing processes to make these materials. So the, if you actually look at this, these are just some thermodynamic quantities. So enthalpy of mixing, which describes the, an element's affinity to either want to mix with another element or segregate away from that element, and it likes itself better. Um, so going this way means it wants to segregate more. Going up this way means it wants to segregate in the grain boundaries and via this expression, reduce their energy. So when you calculate these values, and there's a whole series of models that you can use to do this, you can use first principles to do this, you can use molecular dynamics. We rely pretty much on the two latter, um, as well as theoretical models more recently. You find titanium sits up here, which is in a region where it wants to segregate to itself and occur at grain boundaries. So there's a lot, there's actually, um, let's see, going back to 92, so 31 years of theory that has led to this understanding so far. Um, and this was actually something that I had worked on during my graduate career, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So looking at classical material science, we use what are called phase diagrams, which if you think of water, water has its own phase diagram. It can exist as a solid, ice. It can exist as a liquid, which we usually refer to water, and then gas, which we call vapor. We do this for combinations of elements. So here's tungsten on this side, titanium on this side. And this red area is where we really want to live if we just consider classical thermodynamics. In here, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with tungsten and titanium separated with different what we call crystal structures. Just think of it as ordered arrangements of the atoms. We don't want that. The problem is this doesn't say anything about interfaces. So the way that this has been addressed is we use on lattice Monte Carlo techniques. So you've heard a little bit about this in the context of penguins. I actually thought the molecular dynamics stuff was really cool because we do that. And I always thought of that as an atomic process. I never really thought of taking and parameterizing a Leonard Jones potential for um, hoop colonies. And, and, you know, it's really cool when you actually see that, because when you think about the separation distances and things that describe that force function, it's a really cool application. So we do this with, with atoms. And in this case, this is a, actually a relatively old process, but there's been a couple of new things added to address nanostructured materials. The first is the energy parameterization. And this was really the work that I did back during my PhD days, which was how do we parameterize and relate bond energies to heats of mixing, heats of segregation, different interfacial energies, and so on. And then we go in here, and this was some work that was done uh, 2014, 2012 to 2014 timeframe uh, that built on some of the initial analytical modeling I was working on. And they added, in addition to chemical degrees of freedom, they added this idea to describe grains. And the way that you do that is just by saying you have different grains in your structure, in your lattice. And the energies between these are different than the energy between these. So now you're energy minimizing over two different switching techniques. You calculate a probability. If the 
if this switch increases the energy, you reject it. It's not good. It's not favorable. Sorry, if it ex if that was backwards. If it reduces the energy, you always accept it. If, in fact, it, it increases the energy, you accept it with some probability. That's what I meant to say. So when you look at what this can do, and let's look at some pictures here, these are grain structures that are produced in this technique. So if we have grain boundaries and no solute, and we go through this process, all the grain boundaries go away, eliminate the interfacial energy. If we have solute with grain boundaries, you can actually stabilize different, using different concentrations of solute, one, five, 10 atomic percent, we could stabilize these fine grain structures. This is what we want. So doing this for tungsten titanium here, and we also work in this system and we combine this into what we call a ternary, which is just three different elements together. We go in and we produce contour maps. So on this axis, we do these calculations at every half of atomic percent. On this axis, every 10 degrees Celsius. And we produce these contour maps of grain size. And you can see that as you increase solute, uh, sorry, as you increase temperature, you, your microstructure is coarser, but you can still stabilize these fine grain, these polycrystalline grains. This way, they remain finer as you go up in temperature, and then you start to get phase separation. So where we want to live is really right here. So that's the modeling part. Now we go in and make. And the way that we make these is we take powders, we mix them together, we put them in very high energy uh, mills that spin around at 1,000 1, RPM, and essentially beat up these materials. And in beating up and imparting this deformation energy, you are chemically mixing the different alloying species and you're refining your microstructure or grain structure. So these are X-ray diffraction patterns. And all this does is it tells you what crystalline phases are in your material. And the broader the peaks, the finer the microstructure. Here's a part that we centered and these are you know hockey puck size now. So we're actually making these things. And when you look at the grain sizes, they're made with very fine grain sizes around 20 nanometers. They do coarsen, but notice this is annealing at 1300C. Notice it plateaus. They stop coarsening. Not going to go much into that. When you look at your microstructures, so now this is using an electron microscope. Here's all your individual grains at this point. So after your initial um, the material that you pull out of your sintering furnace, you heat it up and you stabilize it. And you can see we have now about grains around 400 nanometers in size. We do get some titanium carbides forming, but there's a long story for this. We actually wanted this from a radiation tolerance perspective. And then we let this thing just sit in the furnace for, for a full day, actually for weeks, it's just sitting in there. And you can see there's no change. This is what we want. If you looked at a traditional material, tungsten that was deformed like this, you would end up, this is your initial grain structure and it completely recrystallizes after 24 hours at 1350C. This comes with a dimensional change, which leads to that cracking. We figured out a way to solve this using combination of microstructure design and modeling to direct what, what ingredients we're going to add to our materials. And I think that about wraps it up. So, you know, modeling side drives, and we combine this with accelerated testing. So this is some of the work that's going on today um, in situ X-ray diffraction experiments. So you're getting hundreds of data points on a material as a function of temperature that we use to map out stability in these materials, which we then feed back into the models. And we can now make real, real type size plates that would actually be used in a fusion reactor. Uh, some of the recent papers and with that, thank you. I'll open it for questions. So just so people on Zoom can hear it, the question was what materials are used now in, in current tokamak designs? So the one that's furthest along is what's called ITER. It's this very large fusion demonstration that's in France. Initially, they were going to use beryllium first walls and they've switched over to tungsten. So right now, ITER is using tungsten. The subsequent demonstration, which for, the, for Europe won't be till 2050, that's being designed with tungsten. And in the US, we have our own design, 
a couple of designs and three quarters of them right now use tungsten. The other one fourth, they don't know what they're using yet because they don't have their point designs finalized. So right now tungsten's the leading candidate. So there are what we call various single effects tests that we're going to be subjecting these things to. So you start with putting it in front of a plasma. Then right now, because we don't have the correct neutron energy spectrum test station, we throw them into a fission reactor and we moderate the fission spectrum to give us more of a hard, what we call a hard spectrum, peaked more at higher energies. So we do that. So we're using more surrogate testing right now Furthest along is probably a company called Commonwealth Fusion Systems, and they have a very different, so it's still a tokamak design, but designed in a bit of a different way. I'd say, so they're promising to have their, what we call a pilot plant demonstration by early 2030s. I like being ambitious, but I think there needs to be some realism in that. Your point, I think, speaks exactly to that. We haven't tested any of these materials in a real reactor that's under what's called a burning plasma condition which means that it's a self-sustaining reaction and there's more energy out than put in because the energy out comes from using the various um, isotopes of hydrogen under very high temperatures and magnetic fields. Um, so yeah, we don't really have a way to test this. And so ITER is not meant to be more than understanding on a larger scale, the plasma physics of a fusion reactor. Um, and demonstrating a burning plasma condition, but they're not running this thing for days at a time to try and also extract energy. That's really the next step. So in the US, companies believe they're, call it 10 years, five years, 10 years away. I think more realistically, we'll see that by 2040 in the National Academy report that I and a bunch of our colleagues uh, participated in. That was what we were targeting. 2040 seems like a more realistic timeline with the roadmap to do exactly what you're saying for the materials. No, no, it's, we, we have to make these arguments because unfortunately materials have been overlooked. Materials and technology in the, in the fusion energy community has been overlooked because the plasma is so challenging to control. But now where we're getting to the point of building these things, if your reactor falls apart within a week of its operation, that's a pretty big problem because these are not 100 million, 500 million, you know, this is over a billion dollars of investment. Commonwealth got a $2 billion investment recently to do this. And it's just to demonstrate the first step. And that's not even the pilot plant yet. So I like these questions because this is what needs to start being considered if we want this to be a realistic source of energy to completely eliminate fossil fuels from our baseload power grids. So initial capital costs are high, right? And I think a lot of that is the R&D process and the fact that we're going to now superconducting magnets. Higher the magnetic field, the smaller you can make the device. The smaller you can make the device, the more you can reduce its cost. So there's a high upfront cost. The real question, and maybe this is more for people involved in policy and sociology, is what is that cost? What is the realistic cost of that when we start to consider how it will offset all the negative effects of fossil fuels still being our dominant, far dominant source of energy? So if we're, you know, if you look at where money's invested, how much of an impact can this realistically have if we do this? But there are realistic megawatt, you know, megawatt hour costs that are now being targeted for a fusion plant to be considered cost effective. So there are studies that are that are looking at that and setting some some metrics that we need to think about. Are the So you have your initial capex. That's let's say we put that aside. The cost of operating this so you still need energy in to start it. So there's cost of that. 
what you don't actually see with a lot of these things is what we call the whole fuel cycle. So the fuels are two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. Deuterium you find everywhere. Tritium, if anyone's heard about tritium, tritium is radioactive and it moves through anything you try and contain it in. So the costs usually relate to, we are what we call breeding tritium. So we take neutrons, we hit lithium. One of the byproducts or transmutation products is tritium. Tritium then gets pulled out through the molten coolant. And then you have to extract that tritium and then feed it back into the reactor. So it's truly self-sustaining, but the, there's a significant cost with managing that process. And then obviously just usual maintenance costs. Materials aren't going to last forever, so they need to be replaced. You need to minimize downtime. So it's, it's the same level of analysis that you put into any power reactor, just with some challenges that we haven't faced yet because we've never had these running as a reactor technology. Thank you.